afford this car. And to be perfectly honest, most of you guys probably can't either. Heck, some of you guys watching are probably a little bit too young to even be able to drive. The fact of the matter is that most of us are gonna live our entire lives without anyone ever handing us keys to a car and saying, this is your new Audi R8. This is your 2013 Audi R8 V10 Plus. See what we did there? Hi, I'm Ben, and you're watching Gears and Gasoline. And in the interest of appealing to the widest audience possible, we've decided to actually transition into a gaming channel. So you can look for our first Minecraft Let's Plays coming just next week. But first this week, we're going to be examining the relationship between cars and video games. So today we're going to be looking at what is, in my opinion, the four major types of racing games and seeing how they relate to driving cars in real life. And I think it's safe to say that before any of us were driving or racing cars in real life, we were driving cars in video games. As a kid, I know that that was the case for me. Before I ever had any interest in cars whatsoever, I had a heck of a lot of interest in a little game called Burnout 3 Takedown. This is kind of the pinnacle of an arcade-style racing game. It's a game that actually plays better the less you know about cars in real life. All the rides in this game are fake. They're all inspired by real-life cars. They all seem to be equipped with the same over-the-top 500-shot nitrous tanks that are filled up by a divine NOS bottle when you've proven your utter disregard for the safety of others to some invisible racing deity. The controls are super basic, Underseer basically doesn't exist, the AI rebounds faster than my ex-girlfriend, and of course there's obviously a lot of crashing. But ultimately the game is just good clean fun. Hammer your way into these busy traffic junctions. I'm sorry, what? And slam into as much traffic as possible. You said what? For the ultimate reward, trigger the crash breaker for an explosive surprise. Hmm, okay, so this is a game for psychopaths. Obviously, I don't actually have any problems with Burnout. It's just a video game and it's just for fun. But it is a fantastic example of the arcade genre of racer. So I would say that games like Burnout or even Grand Theft Auto or frickin' Mario Kart are the ultra, ultra arcadey games. They don't feature real mix and models. They don't feature realistic driving physics. They're just about having fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually great. Uh, a lot of people that aren't into cars or wouldn't be into cars might kind of get bitten by the car bug or the racing bug just by having a lot of fun racing their friends in some kind of arcade video game like this. So in that way, I think that they're super valuable and they're really fun. They're the kind of games that I started off with as a kid. Forget all the other racing games you can think of. You cannot have a conversation about cars and video games without talking about Need for Speed Underground and its sequel, which is what I'm pulling all my footage from today. Back in the early 2000s, these games were influencing enthusiasts just as much as the Fast and Furious franchise, don't at me. These games were blurring the line between media imitating life and life beginning to imitate media. And nowadays that line is super, super blurred. But back then, that was pretty rare for a video game. The same year that Paul Walker was jumping an R34 across a Miami drawbridge, Underground had players street racing all manner of tastelessly modified tuners around the fictional Olympic City. Underground and its 2004 sequel, Underground 2, helped fuel the 2000s craze surrounding nitrous, underglow, and street racing. So yeah, although the game uses arcadey physics and handling, it separates itself from franchises like Burnout by populating its world with real-life makes and brands. This may have been the first time that young car enthusiasts could get their hands on a 350Z and just totally ruin it. And this was, of course, crucial training, preparing them to ruin a 350Z in real life someday. So thanks to the real-world parallels and the classic soundtrack, games like Underground have maintained popularity in the car scene, and it seems like the recent Need for Speed games have just been attempting to replicate that formula with somewhat less success. That's what made Underground and its sequel so special. Like the first Fast and Furious movies, which caused an explosion of popularity in the modding scene, these games seem to be on the cutting edge of public perception. Kids would see a Civic in this game with a wing and hella stickers tearing around the city, and they wanted to do the same thing for themselves in real life. These games were using the video game medium to inspire a real life passion. On the other hand, games like 2015's Need for Speed, seemingly a game doing the exact same thing at face value, is coming at a really different time. The game is jam packed with Speed Hunters logos, RWBs, Pro Drifters, and Rocket Money kits, but it's almost like it's late to the party. By 2015, all that stuff was already a solidified part of the car scene norm. Literally anywhere you wanted to see it, it was on Instagram. 
The game makers weren't introducing anything new to anyone. While 2003's Underground said, let's put this in a game and make it popular, 2015's Need for Speed said, this is popular, so let's put it in a game. Although the game does feature Larry Chen, so it's probably worth a play, honestly. If you're wondering how you can figure out whether a game is more arcadey or more simmy, which is to say like a simulation, there's a surefire method by just asking one question. Does the game feature boost, nitrous, or rocket fuel that you can recharge by driving like you're on your fifth DUI? If so, it's probably more of an arcadey game. Games like Gran Turismo and Forza, meanwhile, take a more serious approach. Both game series feature real-life makes and models, as well as the ability to customize and tune cars, just like in Need for Speed Underground. But they separate themselves from the arcade genre by focusing on realistic physics and motorsports. Gran Turismo is kind of known as the OG of modern track-oriented racing games. It is unbelievably the highest-selling PlayStation franchise of all time, and has had entries on every mainline PlayStation console from the original all the way up to the fourth iteration we're on now. I actually went and picked up a copy of Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec, off of Craigslist, and I was surprised to find out that this is actually the highest selling Gran Turismo game in the series. This was the first Gran Turismo ever released on PlayStation 2, all the way back in 2001, and at the time the graphics were absolutely unrivaled, and the game will to this day impress with its in-depth tuning and physics engine. My biggest complaint is the steering feel in the game, which makes you feel like you're piloting a 300 horsepower dollop of cottage cheese, so Subaru drivers should feel right at home, but for a game that's almost 20 years old, I'm pretty impressed. But of course, progress marches on, and the game's latest iteration, Gran Turismo Sport, shows just how far the series has come as far as physics, handling, and of course, graphics. The remarks I'm about to make will sound quaint in a couple of years, but GT Sport is the most ridiculously immersive mainstream racer I've ever played. To put it like another YouTuber, this game really makes you feel like Gran Turismo. Forza, meanwhile, is Microsoft's answer to Sony's behemoth racing franchise. Forza Motorsport and its subseries Forza Gridlife and Forza Horizon have been competing with Gran Turismo for market shares since 2005. Both Forza and Gran Turismo are used by their respective parent companies to showcase the latest and greatest hardware and processing power. Whenever a new system drops, a new entry in the series usually drops with it because, as it turns out, good-looking cars look good and they sell systems. One interesting thing to note is that just like driving two different sports cars, Gran Turismo and Forza both drive really different. Just like an S2000, Forza induces liberal amounts of slip angle into its gameplay, so you'll often find the fastest players still exiting corners a little bit sideways. Gran Turismo, meanwhile, likes things a lot more prim and proper. Like a high-strung race car, you better hit your marks, ease on the throttle, and be consistent. Smooth is fast, and a smoke show means you're losing. The two games definitely drive different, and people may be partial to one or the other. Personally, I think they're both fun, but I'm particularly taken by GT Sport. But of course, Forza Horizon is what all the kids are into these days. The Horizon games deviate from the more motorsport influence of GT and Forza, opting for a more freeform car festival feel. It's a fun way to hang out with your friends online and drive ridiculous cars, and the series is currently a cash cow for Microsoft in turn 10, recording the highest opening sales of any Forza game this past year. So as focused as AAA games like Forza and Gran Turismo are on giving players a realistic driving experience if they want it, they're not the most hardcore racing game that you can get. They're not full-on simulations. Games like Assetto Corsa, R-Factor, and iRacing, just to name a few, are full-on racing simulations. They have the focus of giving players the most accurate approximation of real-life driving physics possible in a video game. Ironically, these types of video games that get you the closest experience to driving your dream car as possible are probably also the least likely to interest my younger viewers who can't go out and drive a real car yet, and they probably won't strike that nostalgic chord of my older audience. Racing simulators are laser-focused at delivering a realistic driving experience and, up until recently, have eschewed traditional video game escapism in favor of an experience that is very much governed by the laws of physics. Demanding that players drive smoothly and skillfully while ignoring pretty graphics or a huge car roster means that these games have historically been almost inaccessible to young and casual players. Somebody looking for a casual good time doesn't want to hop into a racing game and wreck on the first turn because they didn't account for their tires being cold, any more than I want to hop into a train simulator and 
I don't want to hop into a train simulator at all, but if I did, I would want it to hold my hand. But for an experienced driver, a game that lets you excel beyond your competition based on your skill level and never puts training wheels on you, I mean, that's gonna be massively satisfying. So in the same way that like a new M3 might make an inexperienced driver feel like Superman with all of its driver's aids and electronic assists, an experienced track rat is probably just gonna want something that gives them total control. Even if that's just an old three series that's slow and that the casual car fan would never look at twice. So as different as all these games and subgenres are, there's a common theme. Whether you're playing a totally fantastical driving experience like Burnout, an arcadey love letter to tuner culture like Need for Speed, or a massive, gorgeous simcade like Forza or Gran Turismo, or even an all-out simulation like Assetto, R-Factor, or iRacing, all driving games are a form of wish fulfillment. With all likelihood, I am never going to get to drive a CTR around the Nürburgring in real life. But when Ben tossed me a controller and I started doing it in Forza, I was geeking out at how cool that experience was. And I knew it was totally fake. So regardless of whether you're some filthy casual who just wants to throw turtle shells at your friends, or some total nerd who wants to pretend that you're Lewis Hamilton clinching the world championship in 2018, there's a racing game for you. And on the off chance that you actually are somebody who's able to afford this car, it's for sale. Some highlights, it's got a six-speed manual, it's got a VF supercharger, it makes about 750 crank horsepower, and it was previously owned by Rocker Eddie Van Halen, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it's currently being stored here at the Driver's Vault, and it's for sale by Performance Auto Gallery, so thanks to both those guys for helping us make this video and letting us use the car. Uh, I wasn't actually driving in the video, that was just sleight of hand. Anyways, thanks for watching guys, and have a great day. This is gonna take just absolutely forever. To be perfectly honest, most of you guys probably can't either. Heck, some of you guys watching are probably a little bit. And to be perfectly. And to be perfectly. And to be perfectly. And to be for. And to be for. The ease in telling us this is your brand new. Okay. Yep. Hey, I'm Paulo DeCudo here at the Driver's Vault, my new automobile storage facility in Rockville, Maryland. Standing here with one of my pride and joys. Uh, my 2009 Audi R8. I purchased the car from Eddie Van Halen. I've uh, had a tremendous amount of fun with the car. Hey, Debbie boy. Yeah. What do you think? I, I grew up listening to a lot of classic rock because of my dad. So I'm not sure he would just love to be here to see this. <laughs> so this is just, this whole place is just rad. <laughs> it's got a VF engineering supercharger kit with GIAC tuning that Eddie had done when, when the car was new. Uh, rated at about 750 horsepower crank power. It's been a tremendous amount of fun owning the car and I've decided now unfortunately to move on. So I'm passing off the car to my friend Alex Whitkin at Performance Auto Gallery. 750 horsepower supercharger right behind your head. Screaming, gated manual. It doesn't get much better than that. In the meantime, we'll keep it here in storage under great climate control at the driver's vault and uh, looking forward to the next toy. Thanks.